What's up, gang? It's Brian B, a West Coast Swing Online. We are here on Derby Day, the first Saturday in May. This is typically our Q&A session while we're on lockdown for the coronavirus. Um, but since it's Derby Day, we are dressed up, and I'm bringing you a, uh, a little fireside chat with my friend, professional dancer, and more importantly for the context of this discussion, dance historian Forrest Altman. What's up, my friend? Oh, I'm doing well, thank you. Good deal. Um, you've been busy. There, yeah. Still right. dancing. There you go. So give us like give us. Day. We've had a couple of chats, um, and for those of you guys who will will link those up below. But give people like a quick background of why you're forest and we're not. Like, explain the dance historian angle and what does that mean? Because until I met you, I didn't even know such a thing existed. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, basically, um, I started dancing about thirty years ago now, and started teaching professionally. I guess about twenty years ago now and a uh, little over that. And uh, geez, maybe 20 years ago or so was when I started uh, researching dancing. And then uh, probably, I don't know, maybe seven years into that, uh, I was in college at the time and uh, did some uh, a term paper that was a research paper. And basically the paper was uh, on Fox Rock history, the origins of the Fox Rock. I thought it'd be a great story. So I did the research paper and had to turn my sources at the end of the semester. Ended up being about 2,500 sources I had. <laughs> Turns out they only needed eight of the term paper, and I had 2,500. So I couldn't turn them in and show the professor, and the professor was kind of in shock. Like, That's not cool. And then continued, told me to continue into the next semester doing uh, research because she said, yeah, that you should keep doing this. And then go to other departments in the history department and such and show them what you've been doing because I think you have got something there. So that's what I did, and they basically affirmed that. They said, this is not normal what you're doing. And by <laughs> that time, I had more sources. So um, that's how I got into to taking it. They were like, yeah, this is pretty intense research you do. Um, and that's really when it took a turn for me, like thinking, oh, you know, history is fun. It's like something I did, did for fun and for personal edification because I don't like feeling ignorant. I don't like... Um, not knowing an answer. If somebody had a question as a student, I wanted to be a good teacher and have an answer for them. So I just started studying almost everything that I get my hands on, really, and um, never really stopped. So uh, that's that's as far as like how I got into it. But the what makes me different, I suppose, um, besides my obsessive nature, <laughs> the, uh, I travel all over the country to archives and at different academic institutions. Uh, like UCLA or maybe uh, special collections at the University of Denver, uh, Drone Robin special collections at the New York Center uh, performing, or Library for Performing Arts uh, in Lincoln Center. It's one of my favorites. Uh, lots and lots of trips to places like the National Archives in uh, DC, as well as Library of Congress. I travel and uh, do one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, prominent dancers in the dance world and sometimes with people that no one's ever heard of before just because they might know something that no one else or to get their perspective on it as well with the average layman those social dancer back then you, you can learn a lot from that but I suppose it's just the depth of, of uh, that I've gone to and I collaborate with other historians as well so it's not just my work that I really represent um, other historians collaborate with me um, this last year I went out to spent time with another great historian, uh, Richard Powers, who lives um, in Palo Alto, California. He teaches at Stanford University. And he has probably the largest dance collection in the world. That's crazy. Um, he just let me go through his stuff. He's mi casa, su casa. So I uh, spent a few days going through his collection, just copying stuff that um, I didn't have and uh, adding to my collection. So I've got a, a pretty ridiculously large amount of information. I'm also on tons of online archives. I pay for subscriptions to archives and, and streaming web services for stuff. So it's just the volume of information that I really have at my fingertips and the amount of books and such in my collection and what I've read and magazines. You get the idea. You can see further when you have more information. That's, that's really the difference. Yeah, no, you for certain make me feel ignorant when I talk about anything because I know how detailed you are and I think in bullet points and you bring the manuals <laughs> to the discussion. Um, so is it fair to say, because this is how I describe you to people, so I, I want to make sure that my description is correct in a bullet point, right? 
because I tell people, I said, you know, if you know me, if I go to town, you know, to, to Portland, Oregon, I might look up the local, uh, you know, cool spot for bourbon and whiskey, but Forrest is going to the library and searching for dance manuals. Is that a bullet point description of kind of what you do <laughs> as your... <laughs> That's the deal. When I go to, to dance uh, competitions and things, or if I do lectures and such in other cities, you know, I'm teaching at an event somewhere, usually there's an extra few days that are spent. Like if it's a Boston Tea Party that fortunately got canceled this year, but I was going to be teaching there. And um, when I'm there, I always spend time at Harvard. It's right down the road. So I spend a few days over at Harvard doing research uh, every time. So people at Harvard know me. So here's a fun stat. My cousin um, actually teaches at Harvard. Um, and so I was teasing with some buddies online. And I told him, I said, well, you should listen to me because I went to Harvard for two years, five days a week for two years. Um, but that's only because my job in high school was on the other side of, of Harvard. So I had to take the T and go through Harvard to get to Cambridge. <laughs> So I did go every year for two years. I know all the buildings. I know my way around. But and I took one class in high school. But uh, I was not. I have not been in the library at Harvard. I, I've taken dance pictures on the stairs, though. Actually, I've been in. I've been in. So I mean, I'm obviously, back. obviously, people who are going to watch this, they are first and foremost West Coast Swing fans. And we've had a couple of chats around this. But for those of the people who are kind of in lockdown and stuck and going to consume this, like. Can, you, can we start with like the quick, brief history of West Coast Swing? And I know you don't like to talk in bullet points. Um, but can yeah, you- Yeah, I know, it's on my gifts. But, and uh, it's a bit about details, but- But can you give yeah, us I'll like Yeah, I'll try a, to give a quick and dirty history of West Coast Swing. quick and dirty history, yeah. Like, how did we get here? All what right. is, how did West Coast Swing become West Coast Swing? Um, where did it come from? Sure, so West Coast Swing really is an evolution of a dance called Lindy Hop, um, originally called the Lindbergh Hop. Um, which um, evolved over the years, uh, and it's continuing to evolve to stay, but uh, in its earlier form, of course, it's danced to faster jazz music, and then swing era music, uh, hence the term swing being used with it. But originally, it was before the term swing was even used, dance was codified. Um, 1927 is the origins of Lindbergh Hop. Uh, then, Really, uh, the West Coast, if you will, side of things comes with Dean Collins moving out from uh, New York, moving into California in 1936, and uh, started to gain prominence there uh, in the dance community. And really, it more so, he started working at Domes, uh, and kind of the hot shot out there. Um, very connected in the studios and got a lot of the gigs, and his dancers, people he knew, he would recommend them. So he was um, well connected with the studios and that got him a lot of work there and pretty much widely regarded as the Lindy Hopper of, of LA, LA. And is that, if I can put pause like for context, is that literally no different than um, XYZ top dancer now? Like if Jordan and Tatiana were in Louisville, like we would book them to teach and lecture our students. Is that kind of what Dean Collins was? No. No, not like, they didn't have that type of, uh, system back then. Uh, they didn't have dance competitions like we do now and big workshops like we do now. That, that didn't exist to them. Um, most people were taught maybe in a dance studio, but they were taught social dancing, not exhibition level dancing. Um, people that did exhibition dancing and such were really self-taught for the most part, okay. or they worked in a school specifically for that type of education uh, where they would learn theatrical dancing with lifts and aerials and things like that, you know, showy stuff uh, we'd see in films. Um, but people like Dean Collins were really self-taught dancers who uh, were competitive, and he moved out there specifically to, to get into films. That was his goal. Okay. Um, so did that. Um, and he was, for all intents and purposes, really an amazing dancer uh, from the interviews I have with people. So far more than what we actually see on film is what I've been told he was just endless source of information. That's great. And so how did, like, what is the origin? And I know we've had some conversations around this. Like, when did West Coast Swing, like, develop its name? When, when, when do we track, like, what's the era that it's developing? And then what's the era that you can track it back to historically? Because I know, I know you find the actual article advertisement and you track it back so like when was it That's developing I, I and then track newspapers is a really great source because it's you know month by month year by year like you go through archives there 
Um, the term West Coast Swing really was popularized in 1958, beginning in 1958, uh, probably 57 as well. I think I've got 57 people on as well. So, the, so it became called Western Swing uh, by 1957 in publication through Laurie Hale, who uh, was in charge of uh, studios, you know, dance directors for the Los Angeles area in Earth Park Studios. Okay. So she wrote a syllabus for it starting in July of 1950. And it re really was Eastern and Western at the time, just using script or terminology to describe the differences between what's done on the East Coast of the U.S. versus done on the West Coast of the U.S. So that's where we get those terms East Coast and West Coast from. They're, they're descriptors of how people moved in different areas of the country, just big generalized statements, essentially. Right? Like a lot of people uh, would say that Dancers on the West Coast danced smooth, smooth style, Lindy, versus dancers on the East Coast were very bouncy. Yeah, so they said they hopped. They would say they were Lindy, they're hoppers, they're Lindy hoppers. We're just Lindy dancers. We do smooth dancing. Um, so that was like an early distinction that would be made between the two styles and what they valued. Um, but the terminology really starts with the term Western swing being used, like I said, in 1950. Uh, and then by 57, it's just referred to as Western Swing and the Arthur Murray Manuals, which I've got copies. I think I showed them in the other videos. Yeah, for sure. And immediately, though, after that happened, um, there was confusion because people thought that meant country and Western because there is a style of music that was being done at the time, in the 1950s, known as Western Swing. Yes, so people assumed that it meant doing Western Swing, dances to Western Swing music, and that's not what it meant at all. It was referring to how people did the Lindy Hop in the Western U.S. Um, so they started using the term West Coast. Almost immediately, instructors were using that term just to make distinction um, so that people wouldn't show up for the wrong reason. Gotcha. And what, let me backtrack a little bit, because we did a video like East Coast versus West Coast in terms of like what the dances, how are they different? But let's give a quick, like how did, how did East Coast swing Evolve. I know I, this wasn't my initial topic, but since we're kind of on the swing styles, I know there's probably tons of regional swings, but like East Coast Swing is another dance that we know and do today. Most people who do West Coast probably have some experience in doing some basic East Coast. Like, how did that? So this would be a weird, weird little caveat for me because uh, I, I kind of hate that term. So, oh, um, beautiful. Why? Because it's really, again, the term originally was meant to describe what was done on the east coast of the U.S. Okay. And it's known as Lindy Hop. It wasn't its own dance. It was east coast style Lindy okay. Hop. Gotcha. So uh, as far as it being a unique codified style, I think really the studios have taken it in a new direction, especially in the last 30 years, uh, and kind of started codifying it. And it's now hybridized with uh, competitive style dancing, and they're taking elements from uh, the other influence of Latin American dances or Afro-Caribbean dances because in the competitive form, of course, you do um, cha-cha and rumba right. and you're doing you know, samba and things. So they're learning all these other dances, bolero, right? And, and that's, right, some mambo. So these are seeping into it. These, if I spend like 400% of my time doing Afro-Caribbean movement and then one out of five dances is doing American um, movement. It's just going to bleed, essentially. That's what I think you see in the competitive forum. And that's what causes, I think, some confusion out there. And, you know, the people, whoever wins the competitions kind of dictates what the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. friends are. Right. right. So if, if I have 400% of my dancing, it's really good in African Caribbean dancing, and I'm going to win. I can't be amazing at, say, Lindy Hop and then not good at the Afro-Caribbean dances, I would never get anywhere. So it's just a value focused on that, and I think that's what you see reflected in the dancing over the years. Um, because there was definitely some confusion with the old-time dancers it, when that terminology started being used in the studios in the 1970s. Gotcha. And so if you guys watching live, if you have any questions, please type them in. Uh, Ben's got a couple, but I want to kind of touch on one thing to kind of finish out this West Coast Swing question, then we'll grab some of the questions that came in. Like when you talk about influences, you talked about East Coast Swing being influenced because competitively it got chunked with some other, um, with some other dance styles that that changed the 
the influence to the dance, and then we start to follow the, the good dancers, the champion dancers that are competing. Like, what are some influences that influences in West Coast Swing that have happened since, let's say, the 60s? What are the other main dance styles that have influenced us up to today? Sure, if you start looking back at the videos, especially um, that we have, you see the, the influence of music. That's one thing that's gonna be a big influence. It's gonna be West Coast Swing was done with the beginning of, if you will, kind of like Carolina Shag also changed and more music. The R&B music, right? Um, stuff like the Drifters and, and uh, Motown and things like this, they started to change the music. Say like the term um, sophisticated swing was one of the early terms for West Coast Swing. Okay. And that was from the song Sophisticated Swing from 1938. And um, when you see what they were talking about and even when they're describing it is the change in the music from being so swinging so hard and being so energetic to being smoothed out jazz music. Yes. Um, so that is, it's kind of like if you listen to stuff from Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra and such in the 1950s, it's different. It's, it's much more about ballads and things, yes? Yeah, yeah. So those are, whereas before with the band was the highlight and then the singers were the backup really. They gotcha. like came in halfway through the song a lot of the time. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah? So now it, it, the singers is the focus, yes? And that, that changed at that time. And um, then that smoothed out the dance quite a bit and it became... Uh, also, if you will, uh, slotting is another thing that kind of became prominent at that time. Um, from the get-go, the, the terminology included the slot. Yeah, so that uh, influence there as far as being able to fit into tighter environments and such changed because when you look at the time frame, you have the change from these big, huge dance halls to when the, the, they started taxing the bands and such. Yeah, at these exorbitant rates, nobody could afford them anymore. So now they had combos and things, and then the venues started closing and getting smaller, right? So um, that started to change the, the way dancing was done in other ways as well, because people are packed more as well, um, and the music is different. So that's an, one major influence. The next, another big one I should say is uh, really hustle. Hustle's a huge one. Okay. So 1970s, we get into the 1970s, and you're going to look at Hustle's influence. Um, hustle really is a hybridization. It uses elements of uh, different dances, like the mambo, right? Uh, we call salsa today, really. Um, it was hybridizing with swing dancing, and the baby is um, hustle. And that has some unique elements to it as well, but those things that it started to bring into the dance, they're so it's so close because it's a hybrid of, of right, the two. Right, right, right. It's very easy to cross over, and that is something that's ever since then has happened. There are a lot of people that compare Latin hustle to West Coast swing. So, like, if I'm kind of thinking in layman's terms, the musical influences are like number one, right? That's gonna that's gonna make a major change, and okay, then whatever this on the radio and whatever the DJs are playing and such, out at the dance halls and the bands are playing, that's who you're dancing to. So it's gonna affect tempo you dance to and the type of hits you're hearing in the music and instrumentation right and, and it doesn't sound at all like jazz right and then the other dance styles that are being done to that music are starting to influence the dance Absolutely. if you're in the same dance hall you're gonna see other people doing other stuff and that's gonna instantly you're gonna pick up steps from other people that's how you learn back then you didn't have dvds and stuff. right right yeah yeah we talked about we talked the other day in a video about you know youtube when we think about it was insightful our very first chat which we had we'd never met and i found you through stephen white uh, on my on facebook you'd commented on a like a little infographic of swing and you made a you know he used he kind of referenced you as his resource as his reference and i was like oh who's this guy and what can he tell us about this um Lost my train of thought. Influences of, they're laughing behind the camera because I'm ADD. Um, <laughs> like, so the music influences things, the similar dance styles that are being done to those influences. So where does West Coast Swing track up? And then we can take some questions. Like, we've gone through a little bit of hustle, and then you, you mentioned um, shag. And what else has influenced West Coast Swing up to modern day? So um, country and Western 
you could say, country and western, you see uh, influences there because after Hustle died, um, the country and western um, subculture really is from directly from the distance. So and may and maybe tracked back to like John Travolta, boom. yeah. Yeah, is exactly. That fair and the say? next big boom in pop culture was the country phase, and in the eighties and into the nineties country was was the number one music in america really. people might not realize that today but country sold more albums back then. Wow, um so that influences dancing as well because that music was pop music if you will in america at the time uh to much greater extent than people realize uh then another influence would be uh people with the first uh u.s open starting around 84 or so uh, i think you start to see then people and coming quick, from. I, if I can pause real quick, U.S. Open for context is like the, the the de facto world championship of West Coast Swing. Yes, that is yes. the. And at the time, that was that there wasn't really anything like that. Okay, it was the first. It was the only thing really like that where they brought in people from other states and started competing. And right by bringing in Kenny Wetzel, started bringing people in from St. Louis and having them go head to head with California dancers. And is it really fair to say in the early days of, of the U.S. Open being like the de facto championship of West Coast Swing, it wasn't, it, and even I think technically by the rules, it's not even a West Coast Swing competition, it's a swing dance competition, is that correct? Yes, I'm so glad you said that. I'm learning, Forrest, I'm learning. <laughs> I love showing people original U.S. Open video because they were doing Lindy Hop plain as day. They used to do half of a song as Lindy, and then the second half as West Coast. That would be the first, you know, five years of competition. That was almost the format: it was slow song, fast song, split down the middle, crossfading one and the other to show your ability to dance slow and fast. Um, because again, and they would also do St. Louis Shag was quite popular with the St. Louis dancers coming over, and also they were teaching it to the California dancers. So. You'd see people go into shag stuff. You'd see people throwing aerials, yeah. and then you'd see them doing what's And uh, so, an old friend of mine, Barry Duran, from the um, I knew him. He lived in the D.C. area. I think he's back in California uh, now. Great. Yeah, like Barry won the the U.S. Open uh, doing East Coast Swing. So yeah, that's right. super it, cool. It's it, it's an interesting thing, but uh, now it's effectively West, West Coast, Coast Swing. swing. And so, country into what has been the most the most recent influences in West Coast Swing, and then we'll grab some okay, questions well, from you guys. After that, you start to see influences of, of course, pop music evolving, uh, and you see stuff where people start to bring in movements from that into the dancing as well, where you have people taking elements, say they're experimenting with hip hop movements and such, putting that in. You see that like with a Benji Schwimmer uh, in his first routines, the open and such. Um, when he was still a junior he didn't get some adults, you know, he had like little hip hop segments that he threw in there. Um, you also see stuff like Robert Cordova and Deborah Sagan. Right. When they um, started doing, bringing elements in from both the uh, ballroom and really having yeah. clean, precise lines yep. and such. Yeah. For background, using jazz dance and such, and lyrical content, um, just making it, slowing it down a lot, you know, uh, the music then. Uh, started, started to change like oh we can do this not swing music I mean they danced to shot A <laughs> right right you and know, that definitely was a thing because technically they were still so good that you had to admit that like, this is still high art and what's the most current influence of swing like what we are doing now when, we're, when we are just if you've been dancing a couple of years and you go on YouTube and you find the best dancers now and you start watching mm -hmm. them and this came, the question comes from our very first conversation in understanding one of the influences going on, but like, what is the, the thing that's influenced West Coast Swing most recently that we're now kind of seeing the ripples of? And if we've only been dancing two or three years and we're kind of copying the movements we see of the top dancers, what's the most recent influence that we're seeing? If you've only been dancing a few years, you probably don't realize how much zook you're doing. <laughs> you're doing a ton of zook, a ton. Everybody that's been dancing for a while knows they're in on it. You should probably train your Zouk. And Zouk is a Brazilian dance? Zouk is the modern evolution of a dance called Lombada, 
uh, from oh, Rio de Janeiro. Oh, look. So, see, so, like, and, and this is, you opened my eyes to that because that was one of the first influences I'd seen because I kind of came in um, in the late 90s, like through the Devers and, and Robert era, and I was seeing that smoother, more technical dancing. And um, that's when I realized years ago, funny, like, story along the same lines is uh, my partner Megan and I years ago when Zook became like a little bit more known here in America we bought all the DVDs from the coolest you know Kadu and Larissa from the best Zook dancers yeah, we could put our hands I got on. Those too, man. Yeah so I, <laughs> I bought and as I was learning those videos and like literally smack dab in their syllabus of basic movements was the cool moves that we were copying off YouTube from the top dancers and we realized that those cool moves that we thought that were unique moves were actually directly influenced. And going back to like 20, 2007, I remember seeing a video mm -hmm. from a friend of mine that said, um, Jordan and Tatiana were you know, teaching West Coast Swing in Brazil and they learned this dance called Zouk and we called it hairography because of all the, 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 but that is, so if you've been dancing today, you are being influenced. I'm here to tell you because I was ignorant until Forrest helped me understand the influences of dancing, um, we're actually doing more Zook than we understand. So we have some questions around West Coast Swing. Mr. Benji, he's going to narrate them back to us. Yes. Forrest, I have my own mic, so don't freak out when you hear my voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first question is, how does jive fit into the evolution of East Coast and West Coast Swing? Good question, because I don't know the answer to this. Hey, cool. Well, um, you don't see as much influence in West Coast swing. However, you could say that they would influence the people that are influencers. So people like uh, Benji Schwimmer have training in jive. So he's able to take elements from that dance or unique uh, movements from it and be able to put it into his dancing to have access to that information if he wants. Uh, where yes, he can start to create using elements from that as far as lines and such to sharpen it up and use that, that Latin dance technique that you see it prevalent in jive. You, you'll see that more so than you'd see actually jive because they're they're wise enough, of course, to, to mask what they're doing and to West Coastify it, if you will. Right, all right. But the ideas often come from other places that you're seeing then put back into the dance. And where did jive, like, where did, where did jive become a thing from the early swing dances, East Coast swing, Eastern swing, um, you know, Lindy Hot? Where did jive become its own style because we now know as a, as a ballroom competitor right i danced in uh, american rhythm and i danced east coast swing and of course i've danced jive and i've danced jive and shows and stuff like that but as a competitor mm -hmm. i was a east coast swing dancer how did jive become its own separate uh dance style if you will sure. well the, the term jive really becomes popularized at the, because of the terminology a it separated them by using the term jive instead of lindy hop and two, um, when the music at, at the time, especially competitions and things like if you look at, say, the uh, Harvest Moon Ball competition, which was the competition in, in a minute com competition in the U.S. It was done in New York City okay. at Madison Square Gardens. Um, wow. They changed the terminology from Lindy Hop to Boogie Woogie and Jive and such to kind of follow trends and to rebrand the division, if you will, over years. So... That's what you're seeing uh, there is the slang terminology being applied essentially, which you see all over the dance history. It's just understanding they're, they're using slang terminology, um, not necessarily for a completely different form. It's evolved separately because it evolved in Britain, and obviously we're separated by an ocean, and right. they already had their own biases because they tended to dance, to dance much more um, proper, right? And they were very clear about that when you, you look at the early manuals i've got a really early manual right here on. oh here comes for this is what you guys are in for a treat on the other side of this camera before the video we saw his manuals so you're in for a treat because when forrest speaks it's legit yeah you guys haven't met forrest yet this is great for you i'll just grab one of them here guess anyone will do here so this is um <laughs> this is why you're awesome <laughs> So this is from the Imperial Society of Teachers of Dance, which most people recognize as like the international dance organization. They really started um, the competitions and standardization and such that we have today. Right. Um, but if we say look at the jive, and this is like page 28 here, let me flip over to it. I'll go verbatim here because they're 
from what I recall, they're pretty straightforward about what it is and isn't. Okay. Okay, at the end of the war, the jitterbug is modified version was introduced to as the ballroom jive. It has been greatly improved in its present form and its universal appeal amongst young groups. What they did, and I think they mentioned it later on here, is they intentionally slowed it down. If you look at the, the tempo, they start slowing the dance down. Back then, they wanted to slow it down because it was done as this like wild uh, dance, you know, Lindy Hop. So at first, they wanted to kind of chill it out um, because it, it was, you know, using acrobatics and such that the youth were doing and spins and all these things and slides. Or, so uh, instead, they wanted it to tame the dance, if you will, and slow it down. Today, it's now it's gone like, the opposite direction of the years now. So now fast. It's super high energy. So fast. Yeah, but it really wasn't that way. Because if you look at uh, the film of the, the first, uh, if you will, jive competitions done in the, um, what would it be, the, the Black Pool, yeah, uh, yeah. which is their Pool championships, you're going to see Wally Laird dancing. and Walter he's pretty Laird. much just doing Lindy. Yeah, Walter Laird, the Wally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to see him doing pretty much Lindy Hop. See, you say Wally because, but in the book, in the Latin American book, it's Walter Laird, is it not, right? You're right, probably yeah. his formal name, right? But then when you speak to people who knew him, so I worked... Um, for quite a few years with Ray Rivers, and he used to tell me stories about Wally. And at one point, I stopped him. I was like, "Who's this Wally character?" He's like, "Walter Laird." And I was like, "Walter Laird, the guy who wrote the Bible of Latin American dancing." Um, so it's funny. Yeah, he would say, "Wally and I were playing golf, and I hit this shot, and I spun around, and that's why we called this rumba step that." And it was fascinating to uh, peer into the history. Yeah, they, they just they didn't have the names for him, so they were making them up. Uh, usually, it, it was originally uh, Monsieur Pierre and uh, his partner. Hold on a second, let me grab it. I'm telling you guys, this is what happens with Forrest all the time. He does not speak in bullet points. He will so bring is, you uh, the resource. Just because it's easy to, to grab here. This is uh, Doris uh, Lavelle's book. This was Monsieur Pierre's partner. He wrote the original syllabus for international Latin American dancing in 1947. So he's the guy that created it. They named it uh, Doris and Pierre created the names for the steps that we know today, just using movement descriptors, they didn't have a name. That's where you get like the term hockey stick, they thought it was shaped like a hockey stick, feather step, because it bowed like the shape of a feather. So oh. that's where we get these funny oh, little yeah. names. Not yet. They were just making it up, they didn't know the actual name for it. Uh, whereas if you look at American books, they generally just describe it as a step and then tell you how to do it. They don't have names for each step. Yeah, we feel like that, like West Coast Swing Online, right? We have 500 some odd videos in our membership site, and there's some videos that are just, you're like, well, does this move? And I know what it's based off of. I know the fundamental concepts, but by the time you add it all together, if you want to like add a name to it, you just end up making up a name that it reminds you of. The New York flat back, because it was some sort of a flat back pattern that came from a video that someone did in New York and we're, we ran out of names after 500 videos and so it's like maybe that move isn't popular enough to become in regular culture but I, mm -hmm. we find ourselves in the same spot. Um, any other questions Benjamin? Hey Ben, oh. next question. <laughs> Sorry, 20 seconds behind you on the live stream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> continue on Jive, how did it become part of the international Latin canon? Okay, well, it started really when the Imperial Society for Teachers of Dancing decided to add it to their syllabi, uh, to the, the dances that were accepted dances. Um, you're seeing that really uh, with Monsieur Pierre, again, and Lavelle, who were the champions of it. They were considered the authorities in Britain on Latin American dancing, and they were charged with creating the syllabus for it in order to teach it. And then once that was out, they started creating syllabus tests for it. So it started to go into the, the testing that was done for all of the pros and the amateurs. And then when you tested, of course, then they started having competitions and was putting the, the professional divisions as well. So uh, then it gained confidence. There you go. Boom. What you got, Ben? We got plenty of questions. I can tell by the look on Ben's face. We've done this for like yes. five weeks, so I can just tell by the expression on his face when there's a question lurking. So it seems as if um, Lindy Hoppers include Charleston and other styles from that era, um, but they don't talk about West Coast Swing being from the same era. Why is that? Ooh, that's a good question. Because it wasn't. It wasn't called West Coast Swing then. 
that's a later term. So you say the word West Coast Swing because it didn't exist yet until 58. You wouldn't refer to any dancing before 58 as West Coast Swing. So specifically, the term West Coast Swing is, from an academic standpoint, they're not wrong to say this, would be evolved Lindy Hop from the late 50s and later. So anything before that wouldn't be called West Coast, it would be called Lindy Hop. So and that's the this, technology they used, or they, they might have called it Jitterbug, right. or Jive, or something like that. Right. And on that question, I'm sure Ben's got some more questions, but this covers something we did in a whole video. If you guys want that, we'll link that up. Um, and you can also uh, Google or YouTube past, present, and future of West Coast Swing. But I asked you a question, and it was super insightful for me. Like, there's been some talk in the last couple of years about West Coast Swing um, having a new name, right? And so, the, and I actually sat down, we talked to Skippy Blair about this, and she had her own colorful opinions. Um, but and she does. <laughs> She says, Westie, what is that, a bird? Um, but when does a dance deserve a new name? Because as people talk about West Coast Swing is evolving and it's not what we used to do 20 years ago, and people, the old timers tend to hold tight to what was, but I kind of sit in a place where I understand, especially through you, that dancing evolves. So, and we all know that West Coast Swing to your point, like evolved from Lindy Hop and it, these branches of swing dancing became their own unique things. When does a dance, not just specifically West Coast Swing, but when does a dance deserve its own name? When does it uh, evolve to have its own name? When, when, how does that process work, like historically looking okay. at different so, dances? So when, when there, it crosses a, a divide where often they, there's disassociation between the two. So let's say Lombada dancers and Zouk dancers, um, they started dancing to a music called Zouk. So they were no longer dancing to Lombada music, they were dancing to Zouk music. That's where the term comes from. Uh, that's why they don't refer to the dance as Zouk often. If you talk to uh, an instructor one-on-one, -on -one, they'll refer to it as Brazilian Zouk because music right. Zouk from the French Antilles, yes? Um, so it's from the Caribbean, not from Brazil. But they were dancing to that music because Lombada music was no longer popular. Yes, um, and wasn't new stuff wasn't coming out, so they started dancing to southern music, and then also the dance was being changed. So then the older the dancers that were still sticking to uh, Lombada style were like, "What are you doing? You know, you're you're changing the dance, you're making it something else, you're dancing to different music." So they said, "Fine, we'll just call it Zoo." Um, so that created no argument. Now that you find you keep that name, we'll make our own. Um, so that would be crossing a divide where it's changed enough that uh, in order to, to not cause confusion or to, to create rifts, they just say, fine, we'll just change the name. Another uh, example would be changing the names with evolution. Say there's many types of, of hustle that exist, and the names help codify it, if you will, right? Like So I can refer to a certain style by using the name of that style. Right. So that would be something where you can change the name um, or change a, even the saying uh, continental hustle, right? Tap hustle or double hustle, um, so that it's clear what you're talking about. And that type of thing, I think, is, is a natural thing to just create language that makes it easy to understand. And, so, you, and you said something yeah. to me, like, and is this accurate? Because a few of the things you said to me have kind of like rung around in my brain, and then I try to, again, distill them to bullet points for people. but. You said something to the effect of like when the, if you use new school and old school, right? The, the traditional um, Lombada dancers and then the Brazilian Zouk component, when those dancers can no longer dance with one another. You said something to the effect of that? Can you explain yeah, that? When it's a different language, when they can't understand each other anymore, when they dance together and it starts getting awkward, that's, that's when it's kind of like um, if somebody hasn't been taught how to bridge the divide between uh, pure Lindy Hop and West Coast Swing. They, they don't say no, the smooth style Lindy Hop that was done in the 40s. It doesn't make as much sense. A lot, sometimes people can't even see how they're the same dance. Yes, and they're like, no, they're not the same. And then when you show them that and explain it, then they can see that and then it's no longer an argument. But before that, um, they just can't see it. Yeah, and I've had that, that I, f I feel like I did an interview with someone um, who has a blog over in England, and I said 
as, they, as I was doing my little intro, I said, I feel like I'm in the position in my, and you're probably in a similar position dance wise, where you feel like you, you bridge the old school to the new school. You've been around long enough that you understand the older versions of the dances, but you understand that there's an, now an evolution. And so I'm sure you're like, well, you've actually helped me in terms of, I say, be okay. like me. You've taught me this, but dancing is going to evolve and change whether we like it or not. And so to understand, you know, what are the elements of the old school that we need to stay true to or understand that we can maybe even reintroduce to the new school, but it's not going to stay the same forever. If so, we would all be doing one version of swing dancing and there would be none of these offshoots, which most of us know, East Coast Swing and West Coast Swing and Jive and Lindy Hop, like all of those would be one, but the influences of the culture and times change those. Yes, and uh, it's important that they do change. That's where innovation comes from. Right. That's, right. that's what keeps it alive and vital to, to current generations in, in different areas, you know. Not everyone's gonna have the access to the same information. And this is where you start pulling in people in their own communities starting to create new styles and trends, which is great, it's not bad. I don't think it's bad at all. That's how art's made. That's so great. you have to give people liberty instead of trying to control everything. Do you have a question, opinion. Ben? Benjamin's got a question for us, or someone online. Um, so clarification on the jive question, why was it latted, or added to Latin as opposed to standard? Um, the opinion is it's closer to Foxtrot and Quickstep, so why did it end up in Latin? Ooh, this is interesting. <laughs> Latin and American dances, that's why. Because originally it was called Latin and American dances. Oh, and Latin. American. So because it was the American dance, it got chunked in with Latin. It didn't yes, matter. Latin that... and American. Because those were the new dances added. So it's really, it's not Latin American, it's Latin and American. Like Latin. That's what originally was. Different... And then later it got the term called Latin American. And, and now we kind of Latin. call Latin. Now it's confusing. That, yeah. see, this is why I chat with you, my friend. That's awesome. Latin and American. Makes a lot more sense now, right? Latin American and then Latin, but jive is not a Latin. I mean, I've known it's an American dance, but it was Latin and these goofy American dances. And then Latin American, <laughs> and now it's all the, all the same. That's awesome. Oh, but no, it wasn't American because it was jive. Oh, it was well, their version of it. It was rebranded. They, they changed it. Right, they changed it. Yeah. And they knew they did. They wanted to church it up, you know, because <laughs> British people um, were a bit little 40 toy deer, you know? And look at us. Someone's going to look at us in this video and be like, remember back in the old days when they were locked down for coronavirus, they weren't able to create cures in 48 hours? Way back in the old days, they had cell phones <laughs> in their pockets. They couldn't even just use their brain to communicate with their mom. So weird back in the old school. <laughs> this is how I think, we Benjamin. One day. We are the dinosaurs of the future era. <laughs> we are. We'll be extinct Yeah, let's too. go. Question. All right, this is from Cassie Lewis. Um, she originally learned West Coast Swing from the late Craig Hutchinson, and she was curious if you could share your thoughts and, on his contributions to the evolution of West Coast Swing. Ooh, I'm sure Forrest can do I That is can't great. That. I wanted to talk about it anyway, so let's do it. All right, Brian, did you have something you want to chime in with? No, no, no. I'm excited to see where we're going to go. Cool. Well, um, that's really getting into something that I actually wanted to, to go back to anyways, just to give a shout out to people like Mario Rabal. Um, Mario Rabal, huge influencer in West Coast Swing. And big influence, big influence to me personally, US for sure. Films, he changed the dance yep. single-handed, okay? Huge influence because the speed he could dance and the complexity of the wraps and turn patterns and amount of turns that he was throwing in the dance, yes? He was a hell of a fast dancer. So Miss um, Megan, who loves to spin, and was influenced by Mario Rabal without even knowing it. Yes, so absolutely. And the other thing is, we talk about Craig, Craig Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. These are people that were doing like what we consider uh, push and whip styles, which are coming from um, North Texas and Oklahoma. Yes, so this style of, of, of dance really is their version and their evolution of Lindy Hop that then was being brought into the West Coast swing dance community. Just like originally we talked about how the US Open was the open to the world, it meant any style of swing. So they were bringing in their style. Right. And that was a huge change because it just brought in new stuff that people had never seen before. And they're like, 
holy crap, what's this? So they all had to learn it, right? Now they got to compete against these guys. Right. So that changed it, absolutely. And one of my mentors actually once said, and this is kind of interesting, he said, um, for those who might watch us that are high-level competitors, um, he, and he was a, like Wally Laird and Ray Rivers and David Kloss was the guy who said this to me, and he said, um, and I met David far before I met um, Ray, and he said, Brian, I've never seen a champion cloned. Meaning, if we are just purely chasing the current champions, if you became the best version of them, you're really just a carbon copy of them. But what you're kind of saying is the influences might come from their own regional influences, their own regional coaches, the people that they're around that kind of create something different that all of a sudden pops out into your terminology, like Mario changed the path of West Coast Swing because of his own specific influences, not that he was just chasing the competitors, uh, the, the mm. top competitor. No, he was coming to bring what he had to offer. That's it. Not people had. So he wasn't trying to be them. He was saying, I got some stuff you've never seen before. Enjoy yourself. And I want to jump in because as a competitor slash artist, right, there's two ways we can go. As a competitor, we want to figure out what people ahead of us are doing successfully. And in the early stages of my career and for the early stages of all of our dancing, it is a great idea to emulate people that are better than you. And it's, it's, it's great to emulate... Um, and, and stay with a particular coach in a path. And then as you get to the higher levels, I think that's where as competitors, we need to really shift into being artists. We have a wider range of knowledge and then we can take that range of knowledge and create our own art. And then even when you're in the top three, four, five of a competitive endeavor, you're the top of what you do. You have a lot of different influences. And at that point, you're just creating your best art and who the winner is versus third place is such a subjective opinion, but there's so many dancers that have not been the winner, but have really changed the way that we look at things. And I think there's a lot to be said for the second, third, and fourth place competitors in a lot of cases that... So right. There are people that win the competition and then they immediately go home and study the film of the other people. Yeah, it's craziness. You won doesn't mean you're not taking notes on everybody else. 100%. You are. What do we got, Benjamin? Switching uh, the line of thought over to the evolution of West Coast Swing and music, starting off with that, when did dancers start dancing West Coast Swing to music other than swing? Oh, good question. Sure, 50s, uh, 1950s. Early. That's really the evolution of rock and roll era and R&B music um, starting to, to come in and Motown sounds and such coming into popular culture. That changed what they were dancing to. And that's the, the first evolution, if you will, musically from, um, you know, you have your, your pure swing era music and then you start getting these influences of, of bop style uh, jazz, which is an evolution of, of jazz, bop, and also early rock and roll and boogie woogie, and then into the R&B influences that came in and the Motown sound and soul music and such evolving in the 1960s. So that changed everything, of course. It sounds completely different. So really what you're saying is uh, the people in the 90s can't blame the youngsters of today for the evolution. It really started from the genesis of it all. From the beginning. Oh. So the very beginning. So it's all going on. We can't, we can't blame you know, this, this new school, old school thing. And this is what I do like about West Coast Swing is that it has such a wide range of music that we can dance it to even today. There's pockets that are dancing it to different styles of music. There's country dancers that dance into country dancing. There's bop dancers that dance into bop music. And there's all these musical influences. And sometimes we think that it needs to be our way. But I like that you brought to light the fact that it started from the genesis of it all, that it's immediately been influenced and changed. That's cool. What we got, Ben? Yeah, I'm saying it's pure. Continuing on that, um, some people don't care for the popular music that West Coast has danced to today. I knew we were getting there. I knew we were getting there. I tried to preempt it. <laughs> um, do you think currently that R&B and jazz will come back and become popular for West Coast Swing again? This is a good question for you, Forrest, because like, what I like about you is you've seen and you've tracked so many dances and trends and you follow the evolution of so many dances. Like, What can you take from what you know to predict where this might go? Okay, I think that you're going to generally have major trends happening musically and um, that of course follows pop music because that's what the masses listen to what's on the radio so that's always going to be a trendsetter versus what you want 
jazz probably isn't coming back on the radio in a big way. So it's probably not going to come back in a big way within that subculture because that subculture is a contemporary subculture. They're not trying to go back. That's the difference between the Lindy Hop subculture is they're sticking to jazz music. So and quickly describe... Because the ball is not jazz music. And it's not going back to jazz. Quickly describe that. As I was doing a little bit of homework for my video yesterday, like East Coast versus West Coast, like the Lindy Hop dancers have really embraced a, a, a space and time, right? In in a lot of their dancing and a lot of their music and a lot of their dress. Is that correct? Like there is a large enough group. Well, yes. I mean, it's it's a dance from the late 1920s that really is through the swing era and through the mid 1940s. I mean, that's the really where the dance comes from and where we would look at it as not before, not when it started to splinter and change into all these other new fractions of the dance. Yes. The, you know, the bop era, the West coast swing. Um, you start to see that happening. We call Carolina shag today. The slow Carolina shag really started in the late 1940s uh, with a hybridization of what they called Carolina jitterbug, which is, Little Apple mixed with Lindy Hop. So, so it, those types of things are uh, new eras, if you will, of music and the dance changing. And so we kind of have to dance with that. So it's not likely, but it is possible that a dance could sort of freeze in time like Lindy Hop has to a degree. Yeah, because to keep its character, you kind of do. You keep to, it in a, at least close, right? I mean, I could dance a mambo to... Uh, a different style of music but it wouldn't really feel or look like a mambo anymore because it doesn't have that same um, orchestration interesting super cool what you got ben so i should mention here that you can still dance lindy hop the other stuff i see it that all the time that was our we last question for that has a i'm sorry one sec the one of the things we have here in, in my local community is a dance here at the gulfport casino here in uh, florida where you have the DJ playing a wide variety of styles of music, from R&B to pop music, Michael Jackson stuff to uh, contemporary stuff to old stuff in the 40s, all. And tons of people show up to it. And we have West Coasters on the floor at the same time as Lindy Hoppers. Yeah, it's funny. Talking about things that are frozen in time. We're, sorry, ben, Ben's on a, for you guys watching, we're doing a pretty good job. And Ben, but Ben is watching the live feed, which is on a 20 second delay. So Forrest and I are real time. Um, but you guys are on a 20 second delay. That's why Ben jumped in. But that's, we've been pretty good after 50 minutes. Um, on that like frozen in time, there's a dance in Louisville, Kentucky called the Rat Race. Have you ever heard of the Rat Race? Yeah. Of course you have, because you're a forest and we're not. <laughs> um, and yeah. this is sort of like frozen in time. And I don't even know the genesis of it, but I do know that to this day, it's danced in a couple of halls in Louisville, Kentucky in a neighborhood called Germantown. And those dancers have been there for 50 plus years dancing with the same group. The young ones are in their 60s. Those are the youngsters, most of them in their 80s and even 90s. Um, and I've found very little history on that, but it's and much like the Loch Ness Monster that we hear about, but everyone, you know, maybe you get a grainy video. Um, a friend of mine met a, a rat racer and invited him to a rat race dance. And so I sent him, this is back, this is probably seven, eight, probably almost 10 years ago. I sent him with my camera because I didn't have a cell phone that had a camera on at the time. And he went down, he's like, hey B, I got you some video of this rat race. I was super interested to see what it was like. It sort of rotates like a rat on a wheel, something to that effect. And he brought me it back and it was a grainy video that was out of focus and I couldn't see it. So like the oh, last no. monster. Um, I've got video to eat it. I, of course you do, and I do. I'm interested. That's I, I, maybe okay. you're in luck. Maybe we'll yeah, I've got video. Keep the rat, rat race. race alive. So, yeah, if you want to know what rat race is, I can tell you real quick. We'll too. chat about that. It's All right. A shot -based box rat. Ben progressively. Benjamin's got a couple of questions. Go ahead. Um, Forrest, have you ever put together a chart depicting the evolution of the various dances? Joe Hoffberg, shout out to you. She asked me to do that uh, when we had a lunch. Uh, and uh, I said, "Ooh, that, that's that's a that's a serious project. Um, when, the more you know, the more you know how much there is, and it's a lot, a lot, a lot more than anyone realizes. It existed historically, existed. I have um, thousands of books, 
and there's a lot in them. And evolution being a constant, um, how do you even codify uh, some some of the things? So, say an example would be would be a little bit confusing because even names of dances. Brian, you're talking earlier about how you named named uh, steps and you just kind of made them up, but really a lot of the dances were new dances that you see named in old publications. What they were is variants of an existing, existing dances, dance. Right. It's given a new a new name. So they might they might call it the Buffalo Boogie, but really it's a variation of Shack. Gotcha. Mr. Benjamin, do you have another question? Because I've got two things I want to cover with you, Mr. Yes. Forrest, before we're done. Um, what is modern swing? I've heard the reference in Spain. Is it just West Coast swing? Oh, fascinating, right? Spain, which is probably relatively new on the West Coast swing circuit, is hearing this modern swing term, which is something that we've heard thrown around and spawned our last conversation, the, the past, present, and future of West Coast swing, like when does a dance deserve a new name? Cause, so it's, that's interesting for us. I don't know if you knew that was ringing around yeah, in Spain. Yeah, I, I know it is. It's actually a, a style that's from um, France, uh, Le Rock or Ciroc. Um So this, this style of dance originally was uh, done as a form of modern swing that was being, that was constructed. It's a made up dance, right? That was made to make a simple form, if you will, of swing dancing that people could do. And it's taught in a step sequence. It's taught in a very exact step one. is exactly the same through step 27. No matter who teaches it, they teach it in the exact same order. So it's taught in a sequential dance uh, order, which was popular in Europe. So it uh, appeals to European tradition in that sense. Um, the style uh, of dance is called modern, um, modern jive. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, I know that from my travels yes, overseas. Yes. Right, they're called Modern Jive. Now it's for branding purposes because it's trademarked. So they had to call it something else, it's the same dance. So that's a little so bit that's where we, like we talked about. The terminology changing from over the years. And this is, is that like, that's a rehash of what happened to East Coast Swing? Like it became codified? Um, it kind of, kind of got rebranded. Yeah, rebranded. They first and written down. Originally called. First they were calling it and then they started calling it different names, and then they kind of forgot where it came from. But if you read the, the dance manuals, it's, it's pretty darn clear. East Coast Swings, Lindy Hop. That's so fun. We got Ben. Yeah, I mean, you see it straight up written. So this is off the swing topic, because as you guys can probably tell, you could go very deep with Forrest very fast on any small esoteric part of a dance form. But like, because this is a blind spot for me. I mean, I was elected to the Country Dance Hall of Fame in 2017. My claim to fame is really actually in know country dancing. Going. What's that? And so I know where you're going. Go ahead. I don't know squat about the history of two step. So give us a okay. brief history, and you and I are going to talk at another time because there's a lot more that I need to know. But give me okay, some sure. my beginner lesson in the history of country two step as we know it today. Cool. All right. No problem. Really, it is. So um, you had dance teachers, especially in the hustle era, that were dancers that were going to studios to get training, right? Um, they, so they were to, to start working, right? So they'd work at a studio. Um, somebody would go there, and then they would learn other dances besides just the hustle. And then those dances started getting put into, say, hustle, right? So they'd take a little piece of this and throw it in there, a little piece of that, right? But the same thing happened is now they, they're – they were first in other styles. And the two-step, what we call the two-step, um, really is um, not the historical dance known as the two-step. Historically, it would be known as the single two-step, meaning it's doing one step and then a two-step. So a single two-step in between one walking step. So slow, slow, quick, quick. But they would have counted back then quick, quick, slow, slow, which is where we get the terminology, right? Because the two-step is a quick, quick, slow movement. Uh, it would be quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow. Um, but then a single two-step would be counted quick, quick, slow, slow. And that's really a variant of Foxtrot. And so it's a progressive streamlined Foxtrot, which is being done to fit into clubs at the time. This is the dancers were dancing at clubs, and they needed to, to keep everything condensed. So you see the very tight, small steps, and then you also see the influence of complexity turns and, and rap patterns and such, because these people were cross-trained and hustled. You blew my mind. Did you guys know that? Still yeah, they're still getting that. Ben's 20 seconds behind, so his mind is going to be blown in three, two, one, go. Um, yes. 
So, so they were all cross-trained, and, and the, the hustle world made the country Western Circle. The hustle world made the country Western Circle. What, like, what time frame was this And, and I could say also the, the, the American-style ballroom as well. It's both. Okay. And, and then Westbrook. What time frame was this? 80s. Early 80s. It was the early 80s. So early the, 80s, yeah. 1983, 1984. So the hustle world. And so I talked to someone who had been dancing um, quite a long time and, and had been a, a dance teacher and run events and trips and all that stuff and had all these years, you know, four decades of dance experience. And he was talking about the, um, and some friends that have owned country bars uh, during the, the, the country craze. And so they were explaining, and maybe it was you added some context to this, that um, following trends, right? Like we all know uh, Saturday Night Fever, and we all know Urban Cowboy. Money. And so you're basically following, like if you're a John Travolta fan during uh, Saturday Night Fever, you want to be a disco dancer because that's the cool thing. But then if you're a John Travolta fan and he's an urban cowboy, all of a sudden you want to be a country person with a cowboy hat. So that was a... Right, you're going to go to the cool club. And the cool club now is a country club. So that's where everyone was going. And the instructors all jump ship to that. Hustle was dead. It wasn't making money anymore. They're going to start teaching what's making money and country's making money. So what are they going to do? They're going to take the dances they already know, Foxtrot, and they're just going to start doing it country and western music. The same, that's why we have cowboy cha-cha, right? I mean, it's just cha-cha. Right. Under country and western music. Right, right. Off time and all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, like, is it, if I, because you know me, I have to take your vast knowledge and distill it to a, a bullet point from my brain. So, it's exist, an existing dance community that does all these ballroom dances, these dance teachers, and John Travolta is all the rage, and so hustles a thing, and then country western begins a thing becomes a thing through Urban Cowboy. And so now I take my existing dance, Foxtrot in essence, that evolves through the music and the culture and the need, because I'm a dance teacher, I need to make money. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. Two Step is born. Yes. So, right. Just applied and changed slightly, you know? You gotta try to fit it into the, the, the culture and such and make it work, right? So you have to rebrand it a little bit. You know, change your stylization. Same as if I take something from another dance style. I don't want to keep the styling characterization from that dance. I'm going to change it so that it fits into, say, West Coast Swing. So it keeps that um, pedestrian motion that looks more relaxed. And I'm not going to have development of arm lines and things. It's going to be quite the same, right? So a lot of us, and I'm, I'm, I, bet, I bet a bunch of people who are watching who are from my era are probably guilty of this. Like when someone comes to me and says, oh, two-step is just like Foxtrot. I would typically say, hell no, it's completely different. And it is, but it did have its root in Foxtrot. Yes, it, it, it is a progressive streamlined Foxtrot. I mean, that's what it is. That's but way it, different it today. <laughs> unique, it has its own unique elements. I think it's fantastic. I think that um, it doesn't matter. If you do Foxtrot, you should learn two step because you're going to get new toys to play with, and it's fun. So... You, you can do it to jazz. To take your two-step patterns and do them to jazz if you want to. They're still fun. We talked up. We talked in our second discussion uh, before this one, maybe I don't know, a year ago or so. Um, one of the things you said to me really stuck, and I asked the question like, "What?" And you can reiterate this in your own words, like, "What can the 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 new school learn from the old school?" Right? Because we know that we're progressing, and the dancers are taking it from influences, and now we have YouTube, and everything is exponentially faster. But what can we do as new school dancers to look back into our history to add? Because you said it with Foxtrot, new tools. What, explain that again for people who don't know. Okay, about what specifically what we can take and learn from older generations or styles that, uh, other styles? Yeah, if I'm a bad mama jama dancer, right? I have a great dance background. I enter West Coast Swing. I start doing really well. I'm a top competitor. Uh, people are copying me. Like, why the heck should I look back to the roots of, of West Coast Swing. Yeah, in fact, I think there's a current trend right now within the West Coast Swing subculture. People are, are starting to talk about history more, and, and pros are asking me questions about history. So um, top pros want to know. So uh, by the way, uh, the other thing is... Um, but why? Practically, yeah. like, why? What can I learn from, like, oh, the right. dance form is oh, going this way. Why do I need to go... Because you can start to, to understand things in a different way and also reclaim them. Reclaim. An example would be reclaim, yeah. Like, you, you didn't know that you could do it this way. Like, if you say West Coast is done this way, 
Well, if you go back to the origins and start looking at the early stuff, it wasn't done just that way. There's other ways. It was done from the get-go. Now, who are you to say the people that originated the dance weren't doing it right? They made it. They named it. They codified it. Right, so right, right. So it's actually 100% accurate to say they did it this way, and now you can too. So it gives you some liberties maybe, and also creative ideas about the, the dance as well. So an example would be somebody who would know this well would be uh, Robert Royston. Sure. Uh, Robert is uh, well-educated and knows his history, but he also uses that history. So an example is he knows that Hustle and West Coast Swing are easily blended um, and were blended. And he uses those for movements like Rock and Goes, which is essentially movements you use in a hustle. Because Hustle allows you to cut time in a six-count pattern. That's, that's the beauty of it. Hustle is a six-count dance that then can be subdivided into sixes and nines and twelves and such. Right? You can extend it or cut it in half by understanding the movement theory behind it, which is really cool. And if you understand that, it gives you new tools. Plus, Hustle has movements that you don't see commonly done in West Coast Swing, such as lateral basics and such. Right? So you can start adding in stuff, getting new creative ideas that you didn't know existed. You blow my mind. We had that question last night. We did a, um, we had a video that we did about rock and goes, like what was a rock and go and explaining it in the context of how we use it and what, defining what it was for West Coast Swing. And, um, and after we put, we put out the video on like Wednesday, we had a rash of questions and I thought that I covered it pretty, pretty well, but people said like, why? Like, why would I do a rock and go? Um, but you said Ooh, to cut time. Because they're wonderful. They're wonderful. There they're, you go. Like, but you can wonderful. talk. That's why I do, do it because if, if, say the hustle has a unique uh, thing about it that, that you can mm -hmm. learn from. And the thing that's fun about hustle is its flow. It has a unique feeling to the flow of the movement where it, it um, almost became seamless at a certain point in its evolution. We started doing syncopated or cut, cutting it in half now that allowed it to have a constant flow. Um, in that movement, that, that concept can allow you to extend a pattern in a continuous flow mm -hmm. rather than having an anchoring action. You really do so blow my mind. You really do blow my mind because what my conversations with you, like it takes and adds context to things that have happened in my dance experience. So Emily will remember this like a, uh, she's on a 20 second delay, so she's not going to react to me. Um, but a year ago, we were at a, a Derby Gala. The, the literally yesterday last year, um, the Friday before yes. Derby last year. And you got our Derby on. Yeah, yeah we're, we're derby look, you're looking good, my friend. Um, you got that, like the old world wood behind you. It looks good. Um, we have the twin spires. I don't know if you guys can see. I don't know if you can see Forrest. There we go. No, I can't see you, so. Take, turn that blind. To, turn that, we have our twin spires back there mm -hmm. for, the, for the Derby. We're, we're doing good. Um, but so the... Um, Emily and I were at this Derby Gala and they had all these uh, uh, like top artists, but not of like today, but like of a couple years ago. And it was one of them like Casey and the Sunshine Band, some like hustle bass band. And so they, what they did was they hired the, the, the best cover band in Louisville that was like the back band. And then they hired the front man to all of these bands like CNC Music Factory and Mark McGrath from um, Sugar, Sugar Ray, Sugar Ray, whatever they were. All these popular songs, I'm terrible at that stuff. And so one of them was a very 70s like hustle-based thing and they had whoever the lead singer was. And so they'd run their set of music and you were literally dancing to this person. And so it was super cool for me because no one in the room was a dancer. Everyone was focused on the band, right? And they were all dancing in front of it. And we just went to the side, we're all dressed up and we just danced West Coast Swing to whatever the song was. And so I posted one of the videos and someone said, man, it looks like hustle. And for whatever reason, right, I was just in the moment feeling it. And when I watched the video back, I was dancing a shitload of rock and goes all over uh, the place because the music just kept feeling like it went, you know, and I'm a little old right. school with oh. an anchor step. But it's funny. I was, in essence, just reverting back to the feel of the music and defaulting yeah. with a lot of rock and goes. Man, you blow my cool. mind, man. Yeah, there you go. That, that's exactly why you should... Uh, look into history not because it's something it's not really about oh. the history it's what you can learn from the history that makes history interesting and I personally don't like um, people ask me all the time about writing books and I was like I'll do that you know when I'm old and can't move anymore until then I'm gonna dance and I'm going to take these things that are old and bring them back and hopefully help uh, teach a 
our current generation and future generation stuff so that they can reclaim it and learn from it. Reclaim. All right, we have six questions to rifle through, and then I've got a question for you to finish <laughs> off, Mr. Um, six uh, for now. Um, staying on the rock and goes, um, some people have heard all search say that rock and goes should be used everywhere, but where does that leave the, the fundamental West Coast swing of having an anchor step? Oh. You that's need to a, talk to Forrest three times, and after you talk to Forrest three times, you'll know the answer. But I'll let you answer. <laughs> Okay, well, the the idea of using continuous rock and goes, that's going to start to look a lot like hustle. Um, so uh, I think that it's fine, especially if it's on a competitive situation. Who cares? Do whatever you want. Do straight up hustle, mix it in. It's fine. You know? um, outside of that, if, you, if you're looking to, if you can lead it and they can follow it, aces. Um, outside of that, then you're really looking at, um, in the competitive form, you have to just make sure that, you know, you have, the aesthetics have to, to match up. And if you go too far down any rabbit hole, it's going to, to end up being a detriment because it's no longer looks like if I turn the music off and I can't tell it's West Coast anymore, after 15 seconds, it's not West Coast anymore. Boom. Great answer. What do you got, Ben? I'm sticking <laughs> on West Coast Swing and kind of codifying West Coast Swing a little bit. Do you think that the addition of a swing content and judge at the U.S. Open will lead to more codification of West Coast Swing. Mm. I'm sure you're up I, I, on this topic. Or yeah. So this yeah, year, just just like for long just, haul there. just for context, the U.S. Open now tried to somewhat define West Coast Swing and create a swing content judge, and really try to put a little bit of a box around what is West Coast Swing. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, they, they, they're because you have that that battle we were talking about earlier between the old new guard happening and wanting to make sure that it doesn't go too far, um, where you know that you can't have generations from or one generation dance with another and, and they can't dance with each other. So they're trying to make sure that the core of the dance stays, if you will, there, and, as well as allowing for evolution. So you have to have a little bit of the old um, as well as the so will it, this is my own question, and Ms. Emily is actually going to jump in with the next question because Benjamin's snuck off behind me. Um, if West Coast Swing were to put itself like, like maybe East Coast Swing did, like if everyone adopted the same syllabus with exactly specifics and we wrote a book and everything, this foot was angled one-eighth of a turn to the right, mm -hmm. like would West Coast Swing as we know it like freeze into a box? And then the mod, no, it would not. Not a bit, not even remotely. There are already rest of swing syllabi all over the place. Hasn't changed a thing, never will. So right away, write your own syllabi, it's great. Syllabi just means structured system of learning. That's what the definition of a syllabi is. So it's a way that a teacher can uh, basically show what are the required elements for you to be able to dance with the person on the social dance floor. So what, what are the steps that you need to know to be able to get on the dance floor and dance a whole song with somebody and not be confusing, right? So you're not right. just making stuff up. You're doing the vocabulary, if you will. So that's the, the function of the syllabi, and we already have it. You know, everyone already knows that you do push breaks or sugar pushes, and you do left side passes, right side pass with underarm turns, a whip with an inside turn, whips with outside turns. These are They already have a language that's codified already. Writing it down doesn't change that. And let me, let me put a pause. If we go dark for a split second, uh, will they still be able to hear the audience? Oh, so I'm going to go dark for a split second. They're going to be able to see you. We're going to change the camera battery because we've been shooting here for almost two hours tonight. So I'll keep talking. But um, what is the next? You can kill us. What's the next question since we'll be able to see hear Miss Emily? The next question is, would you categorize country competitions like on the UCWDC and the ACDA circuit as country ballroom? And yes, um, let me also mention the word ballroom means partner dancing. So yeah. West Coast is for ballroom. If you're talking about actual language, mostly now it means standardized uh, competitive form of ballroom dancing. It's what people generally are referring to when they say ballroom, they, meant, they mean a, American style competitive um, NDCA certified events. Um, so that's what we'll refer to as ballroom dancers, dancers in studios that are doing American or international style ballroom dances that's codified there and it is a, a an american form of ballroom dancing that is codified 
There you go. So it is country ballroom by definition. Everything it's is ballroom. ballroom. Ballroom is a partner dance. Oh, so not fun. a dirty word. I like it. I like it. What do we got, Ben? How do you feel about the ACDA adding Viennese waltz to their competitions? Do you know about this Great. ACDA, the American Country Western? No, I didn't. I don't think so. Yeah, the ACDA uh, no, is like it's the UCWDC is the is the wide reaching right. worldwide, right? Um, ACDA mm -hmm. is was largely down around, and it used to be called Fun Country, like Oklahoma, Texas, and now um, I think because they're a smaller organization, they're a little less structured. They've started to allow mm -hmm. events in lots of different areas, so their reach is growing here in North America. I don't think it's out of North America yet, but they've they've added Viennese Waltz, and I'm going to add my own context because there's quite a bit of Viennese Waltz music naturally in country dancing, and Ben and Emily are both bobbing their heads behind the camera. So they added um, a ninth country dance to their, their syllabus and their standard, which is Viennese Waltz. So should they do that? I think it's great. Great, I think it's great. Um, the only thing it is, it's just waltz done fast. I mean, so fast waltz, it's just gonna teach you a new skill set. You're gonna learn how to, to move faster. You're gonna learn what you can get away with and not get away with. Don't be afraid of it, it's just fast waltz. And that's a clear indication of like the music driving, right? We're in a country dance form and country music that's being played popularly because we all know if you guys country dance competitively, we're like, oh, it's the same two steps. It's the same cha-chas because there's not a lot of new music that way. But in my last 20 years of dancing, nightclub two-step has become very big because of the ballady country songs and Viennese waltz has become big. So we're really Ooh, just yeah. following the trends of the music in our dance form. I don't see a problem with it whatsoever. I think it's great. It helps give you something new to do and expand your horizons and uh, keeps it fresh. You know, they can add dances. They did it with Pony Swing. Pony Swing used to be a dance, not done anymore. Right. So right. they took that one out and added in other stuff since then. You know, like Triple Two wasn't there. It's there now. It was called Double Two back in the day. Yeah. And you know, now it's called Triple Two, and they smoothed it out and churched it up. Yep, and they made it a smooth dance, and they did that intentionally, and it's cool. I mean, I learned it, and it's fun. Yeah, I still don't do triple two. They make fun of me. Fun. I hate triple two. What? I'm like, I'm very old. I became old school. I was like, uh, triple two wasn't a thing, because for. And I'll give you my history, and this is me being crotchety and old, because to this day, yeah. my students, know, I don't do triple two. I do the other seven I dances, and I didn't. I don't do triple two. Because to me, it was like, well, the competitors only started doing triple two because it was a competitive advantage. It wasn't one of the cool dances. And so I was like, that's not the way we used to do it. We just did our, when I was started, my seven dances. We didn't need this eighth dance to try to get a, a, an extra win. So I've become old. But now it's become such a freaking thing that I don't do triple two. And I'm going to try to end my dance career well, before I do triple two. Yeah, and I also think uh, triple, two, triple two evolved from basically it's, uh, elements of two-step hybridized, um, country and western two-step, I should say, hybridized with, um, well, swing. So it's swing yeah. on the run. Yeah. And um, that's what we, they call it. They call it double two to help delineate between the two evolutions now. Right. Um, when you're you're dancing it slower or ballad music or having balance, progressive motion more. So I think they're both great. And um, if you want, want, give them a whirl. You might like it. And just to add context, even though I don't competitively dance triple two and I seem to hate it, um, I think it is the bachata of two-step where a lot of salsa dancers dance bachata and bachata is very slow and approachable for a brand new beginner. It's not fast, it's not difficult, it's very enjoyable, it's got some music that matches it really well. Um, I actually, that's actually what I think about triple two. I think it, it probably should be the precursor to two-step because it's slower moving, slower music, much more approachable for the, uh, the masses. So I don't hate it completely. What do you got, Benjamin? Mona wants you to talk a little bit about Rhythm 2. Mona Brand from Arizona? We don't like Mona Brand from Arizona. We're not, gonna, <laughs> not answering her. Of course we love Mona. Can we talk? Was it Rhythm 2? Yes, she said, what about Rhythm 2? They took that away, but they still do it in Arizona. They call it the Arizona 2-step, and it's very popular there. Yeah, for sure. And I love Arizona. Rhythm I'm going to retire there, so I need to know. Term, so maybe, maybe tell me what, what you, you call Rhythm 2, because I might know it as a different name. What do they call rhythm two? What is the, is it, can we ask Mona for uh, clarification? It's the Arizona two-step. Arizona two-step. So their version of two-step. Can you get Mona to give us clarification? We'll, and Give us the next question, and then Mona, if you can give Ben clarification, we can circle back to that. 
but it, it, it might have a, a regional name or something. The, sure. oh, yeah, good. you're good. Right, perfect. Um, switching topics just a little bit, there's a few questions on the distinguishing factors from the different swings. So there's country swing, there's ballroom swing, and there's circuit West Coast swing. What makes them different? Hmm. Ballroom swing's not a thing. That's number one. Somebody's made up name. I don't know what it is. You're making it up. <laughs> so, um, so what was the other one? There's, country so swing. A lot of country it. swing. Country swing. So country swing's a modern evolution. It really is kind of elements of cumbia blended with a bunch of aerials and lazy footwork for the leads. And it's great for clubs. For young people that like to chuck women around, it's great. <laughs> so, it's it's Good. fun. Young bucks want to throw people around, do some fancy stuff, and look cool. Hopefully, not knock people out in the process. That'd be great. It's funny for us because we we actually when we had these live videos, right? We did two. Vi we've been doing two videos a day for like f this is five solid weeks tonight. So five weeks, six weeks, five weeks—a long time. So we were like, hey, let's take a stab at some like country swing and stuff. So we we scoured the internet. We tried to figure out. And I've danced in country bars all over the world, like not only North America, you know, America, Canada. But like I've been, I've been lit up in a German country bar in February of 2000 and not, so I've been around the country bars and country swing is for sure a thing, but there appears to be no basic to it. Like you said, like lazy footwork and the aerials. Um, but we try to like codify it to try to create like a, a somewhat of a basic, kind of a single time swing style stuff. And as we were tinkering with it to be able to figure out what we knew about dancing and how to create a basic so the leaders and followers could learn it, it's super fun actually. It was super fun. It was because it was a wide, we could dance into a wide range of music. Um, as soon as you created somewhat of a basic and some footwork for the followers and we, kind of the evolution of West Coast Swing Online was, as teachers we were doing like a lot of us do, you kind of go, oh, what are we going to teach tonight for class? We've done all the patterns that we know. And you go on YouTube and you learn some patterns and you kind of have to deconstruct what these high level pros are doing into a way that can be um, given to the average student. And so doing that for country swing was pretty fun. And we actually really enjoyed it. I think we're going to continue that process. I think Ben's got some clarification. Um, on yeah, it. clarification. Not, sorry. Country swing is in the differences between circuit West Coast swing, what you see on a WSDC event, and what you see at a country event for West Coast swing. Oh, like a what happens? Yeah, well, yeah. Like, why are they so different? Why does country West? Why does West Coast swing at a country event look different? So we're than talking a about West Coast swing specifically. Why does it look differently different at a World Swing Dance Council West Coast swing event versus what does West Coast swing look like at a UCWDC country dance event? Because I've got some thoughts. This is at least in my wheelhouse. But okay, I well, I personally like things being different. Um, I, I, I know, when I talk to uh, promoters, event promoters and such for the country western circuit, I'm very animated about telling them to keep country country and not try to follow trends in American style, per se. Um, it keeps it unique. You know, when I look at back at videos of people doing... Um, stuff in the 1990s looks quite different than what you see at, say, the, the West Coast Swing Circuit done competitively. I think that's great because it's bringing unique elements and their own style, right? And they're dancing to the country music and it feels more authentic to me yep. than trying to, to change your outfits and things and to, to really try to dance it like Jordan and Tatiana would. He said, I like it being different, so it's even weird. That's my, my, so, my two cents on yeah, it. Yeah, so I have a take because this is, this is within my wheelhouse because I've, I spend the better part of the last two decades in both those worlds. And country actually brings something different. Country West Coast Swing, when you see it competitively, brings something different. So in Jack and Jill's, you are dancing organically where you don't know your partner and you don't know the song. It's, in essence, a pure social dance. Um, at the height of the... World Swing Dance Council, you're talking the routine divisions, you're choosing your partner and you're choosing your song, right? So those are two dynamically different things. And the dancers in that world do both and typically the ones who are really good at this are also good at the other one. The, the best routine dancers are also, generally speaking, quite good at yeah. Jack and Jill's. Good dance, period. Yeah. They're good dancers. I mean, not always, um, but generally speaking. Country brings something different because in country, if we're dancing competitively, whether in pro-am or professionally, we are choosing our partners. We have our partner, regardless of the level. Mm -hmm. But 
we don't know the song. So when Megan and I dance, we are not dancing like we would in a show where we choose a song that inspires us and we choose our, art, our, in, our artistic influences and our skill sets and we bring to light which would, would be done in a routine division at the World Swing Dance Council. We're mm -hmm. like, we're going to get a song that's 104 to 108 beats a minute and mm -hmm. we're, it's going to be played for two minutes and we just have to dance to it and there's a slightly restricted skill set. We can't do aerials. We can't do one-footed spins in our division. We can, but there's a specific rule set around it. So what we have to do as competitors becomes a different hybrid version of a routine and a social dance. So that was our tact as a competitor was we would in essence social dance until we found stuff that worked cool and felt West Coasty. Mm -hmm. But then as we mm -hmm. refined that, the connections and the ability to ebb and flow timing changed to be way different than a, uh, than a Jack and Jill, but it yet didn't bring mm -hmm. the full artistic uh, flair of choosing our own music. So I think in my estimation, it, it is a different version of West Coast Swing because it's not purely, I don't understand my partner and what the song is gonna be, and it's not, I'm choosing my song and my partner, but I'm choosing my partner, I'm choosing my material, unlike a Strictly Swing, where I choose my partner, but not the song, and I can't have a, a routine. In country, we have a routine, we do know the speed of the music, and typically the style of music, there is a difference in styles, but um, the dancing um, looks different. If Megan and I did a routine socially speaking, it would look way different than it would competitively because competitively we know it's 104 to 108 and we know exactly how much time we have in a stretch. And so it develops and looks stylistically different. To some degree cleaner than a Jack and Jill, but not as artistically um, wide ranging as a routine. I could chime That's in. That's a great answer. I could chime in. Forrest, that was a good answer. I'm so happy with myself. <laughs> What'd you get, Ben? Um, going back to Mona real quick, she said that it's a dance that actually used to be danced competitively in the UC called Rhythm Two Step. Um, she's pretty sure Richard McMurray won a world title in it. But the basic is a walk, walk, step, touch, step, touch. Ah, cool. All right, yeah. I she said she calls it country batata. Okay. Wow, that's a weird name. But okay. Um, yeah, I. I know that dance originally um, came from Continental Two Step or Continental Hustle, was what it originally was, which is a, a variant of Foxtrot originally. Um, you know, using a sway step and then a progressive run. So um, then that was brought into the country and Western world, and uh, changed in time, of course, as the people make up new steps and uh, the music, of course, is different. But um, yeah, that's a that's a style that you don't really see done anymore. A lot of people call it Texas Two Step as well. Um, that it's just simply not done anymore. It took it out of the competitive world, and, and outside of certain subcultures, you just don't see it anymore um, done socially and competitively. So people don't have exposure, and it's, it's dying slowly. Yeah, but that's interesting. You say subcultures because um, as I'm looking at two step, that's why I was interested in the history of two step, and we'll chat more on that at some point. But it is what people view as two-step in their own country bar and their honky-tonk, whether it's in Calgary, Canada, or Arizona, or Texas, or Chicago, there's very different sub, your terminology, subcultures of a dance form that might have been the same at some point, but now is completely different. Next question, Mr. Yeah, yeah, like that. Yes, like this is Texas from the stuff. UK. Um, they said that in their area, every older person knows of a dance called the Rock and Rock. Has Forrest heard of that? Sure, he has. Rock and rock. Rock and no, rock. No, I actually don't know of a rock and rock dance. Uh, that's an interesting uh, name. It, I would be interested to see uh, any film of it because uh, most likely I know it as a different name. I would probably classify it as a different name. It's probably a, a regional term, again, for a, a dance I would know as something else. Boom. Next question, Mr. Ben. I'm behind, so I can't hear. The rest of the question was, um, they're told it's a form of jive. Do they think that rock and rock came from Lindy Hop? Hmm. I'm sure it did. <laughs> As many dances seem to have. Yes. Uh, it's just, so when you, when you say the word rock and rock, like rock and roll, the rock and roll era, they were doing a, a elements of the dance called bop. Okay. And, and there were different variants of the bop. 
Yeah, so some of them used different uh, timings or changed timings. But you see that, um, and some people refer to that as jive as well, but uh, or like street jive, you might hear people call it. Uh, I would know it as bop. Um, but it was because of what was being done in the 1950s, the rock and roll era. And um, that in itself is their, that period of time, that culture's rendition of Lindy Hop. So it's, it's, it's evolution of Lindy Hop done to their style of music in their own way. Super fun. What you got, Ben? So the last question that I have for now, um, what is blues dancing and does it mean anything to the West Coast swing community? Oh, that's a fun one because I don't know the history of blues dancing and why, because it seems to be somewhat linked. A lot of West Coast swing dancers dance a lot of blues. They seem to like that. What, how does that work? Okay. So blues dancing really is, um, well, as far as a codified system, it's modern. Um, it's been something that's been constructed over the years using elements taken from different uh, types of dances. Um, such as a slow drag, which was really just slow dancing back in the day. It wasn't a codified system of dancing. It meant, you know, doing the hoochie coochie, bumping, grinding to slow music, which is probably as old as the hills. Um, so that that type of movement and adding in elements from other styles, like you see elements of taken from tango thrown into there, but again, yeah. stylistic uh, added to the, the, a blues music aesthetic that so changes the, the feel and the way they use a lot of body rhythm and such in their dancing and such, right? Um, so you're going to see, you know, shimmies and things added to it. But uh, that, if you will, blues dancing, then people, you know, get exposed to that and then they bring those elements into West Coast Swing, right? Um, the one that comes to mind is um, uh, there's a DVD, I think it is, by Miles and Tessa. Yeah, off the top of my head. Miles and Tessa did one that was like um, blues dancing for West Coast Swing. And um, oh, yeah. they talked a lot about that and how they you know, use delayed timing and such and smooth it out and uh, maybe usage of body rhythm and things in it in order to dance to blues music. So um, that again, the music changes how one's influenced in their dancing. And you don't want to be doing a staccato motion to a legato uh, sounding song, right? Right. Super fun. Any other questions, Benjamin? Yeah. He's laughing. This, so, Forrest, if you don't know, there's some always interesting discussions that go on in the live stream that have nothing to do with the discussion. And Ben does a great job at threading in the questions in a logical flow. But sometimes the discussions go off the chains in the... Uh, in the so, yeah, I always, like, the next morning, I'll click on these videos and I'll look at them and I'll be shocked that there was 120 comments and they have nothing to do with... <laughs> discussion, but it keeps everyone entertained, which is half my goal when we're in lockdown, right? We're going to learn some stuff, and if you just need to be entertained, yes. that's part of it, too. That's a great part of it. Um, but I've got one final question. Are you entertained? Enough. What's that? But are you not entertained? I, I'm entertained, dude. I'm thoroughly entertained. <laughs> Mona um, it said she's sure that the outfits in your closet, all of your jackets and everything, she's wondering if they're getting lonely. Oh, my jackets. So I don't know if you know this about me before. So the Derby is like a big thing here. And I first went, how many years ago, Em? Six years ago? Six years ago, I went to my first Derby. I've lived in Louisville since 94. And like a lot of locals, I just sort of looked at it as a way that a bunch of people like invaded my city. And if I could leave town and rent my house out and make a bunch of money, I thought that was a good way to go. And then when Emily moved here, we decided to go to the Derby. And I realized that people spend like thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to come to Louisville and pay ridiculous rates. So I started going to the Derby every year and I thought I would never miss one. And, um, which is why we're dressed up tonight. Um, so I have, after six years, I have like quite an extensive, uh, yeah. And even like this stupid jacket, you guys can't see. Is that back to the camera? Like, Shout out to my friend Scooter who paints these jackets for me. So I'll wear a jacket one year and then I'll have him paint me something up really cool so I can wear it again. And we themed our West Coast Swing event, Derby City Swing. Like it's all Derby themed, which is why you've got the, which side? This side behind me, these twin spires behind us. So we have another question that I've got one more question for you, Forrest, and then you can. Okay. Since Lindy Hop seems to be the basis of so many of today's dances, where did Lindy Hop come from? 
Oh, shoot. Lindy Hop. <laughs> sure. So when you go back to the earliest um, description of Lindy Hop, and, or it was called Lindbergh Hop originally, this actually, the, from the beginning, it was called Lindy, Lindy Hop, and Lindbergh Hop, alternately. But um, so that, uh, the first version of it was originally done um, by tap dancers, if you will, uh, tap dancing oh, duo. Wow. Um, but it, professional tap dancers made up a dance they dedicated called Lindbergh Hop. But it was, because um, it was uh, done by these pro, pro tap dancers, yes, in uh, the Winter Garden in uh, a play called The Circus Princess, um, they, uh, of course, it'd be like Fred and Ginger, right? Um, so their dances aren't really social dances, they're not ballroom dances in that sense, and they're not for the layman, right? They're for entertainment. But just like Fred and Ginger, you find that they made a ballroom version of those dances for the layman because they wanted to use the dances that are being seen on screen or what have you. So um, the dance masters, because Charles Lindbergh was coming back into town, they immediately said that we need to make a ballroom version of this, meaning a social form that's a lead follow based dance. It's simplified. Wow. Yeah, so that when Lindbergh comes back, you know, he's got it. So they immediately uh, had one of their uh, dance masters basically make a, a social form of it. And that was the original form of Lindy Hop, the old Lindbergh Hop. Uh, that's why you see two different descriptors. Originally, one says it's really complex and hard, and the other says it's really easy. Well, they're referring to the same dance as one the stage form, and the other is the social form. So a little bit of confusion there, but if you understand what they're talking about, it makes way more sense. Um, so they, they wanted to have that in the, the, the studios ready to be taught by the time Lindbergh came to New York after he first stopped in D.C., and met the president, then he came to New York, and uh, they figured everybody would want to know the new dance named after Charles Lindbergh. That's so Such a big deal. freaking cool. So yeah, that was then, but that dance wasn't like what we consider Lindy Hop today. What we consider Lindy Hop today is a hybrid form. So Shorty George Snowden, who many people quite uh, quote is like the father of it, really was the father of the incorporation of breakaway into Lindy which is what we call today a, a swing out or whip. So he started using this element as his base form, using that uh, concept, yes? And so that became almost, if you will, the basic, because it's um, sensational. And once you get used to playing out outside and being able to do independent footwork, that's allowed for improvisational footwork, which he started to do, um, it, it's really flashy. So he won competitions, became known as the Lindy Hop guy. But they were also incorporating movements from the dance called Black Bottom, uh, which was popularized in 1926, and the ballroom form of Charleston, partner form of Charleston, which was popularized in 1925. Uh, those were hybridized with it immediately, and you can read that in their own text as well. Uh, as well as another thing called whirling, which is where you're spinning, or I'm sorry, they call it wheeling. It meant to, to, to spin, so continuously, what we call a lindy circle. So, if you, I, I, you know me, I have to take all your knowledge and make it a bullet point. The, the sh Sorry, yeah. And, and, Ramble. Yeah, and a, uh, uh, what's the word? A, uh, the infographic would be tap dancers of the time created a dance, a show, if you will, that they later had to, you know, people became inspired by that and they had to create something that they could give to people. And that... It was just, it's all, it's all just, you know, marketing. Ah, uh, right? so fascinating. I wanted to be on top of something because it was a big deal. Got in all the newspapers. <laughs> Associated Press talked about it, so the, the dance master was like, hey, we need to get on this. So they did, and then they created a dumbed-down version of it. Then that was hybridized, was done in a closed dance hold. It didn't have any breakaways. And then later on, it had, Jordy brought in, started doing breakaways, and he was blending it with Charleston and the Black Bottom, uh, which you read in the articles from the dance marathons in 1928. And from that point on, really, it goes on stage. The Lindy Hop now is on stage in this new form ballroom form, not tap dance form, in 28 with Shorty George Snowden when he was in the Blackbirds in 1928 with Bojangles Robinson. And that's the black, that, that's the Lindy Hop that we know today. It will be the original, if you will, which you see in the movie After Say Ben. That's so fascinating. Are we on, Ben? That's the, or the real story. That's crazy. You really do blow my mind every single time. It's cr like it's normal for you, but for those of us who have no context, and even me, like I feel like I've got enough cred. I've been at this for twenty plus years, um, and I'm still blown away. So, tap dancing was the initial influence for Lindy Hop. 
see so many elements of tap dance as well. Right, right, in, right, in right. Dance. Tap right. Dance is a huge influence in, in social dancing. And in the mid 1920s, tap dancing was the, a big, big phase in pop dance culture. So tons of people were doing that and another another variant of tap known as eccentric dancing. Um, so th those two things had a big influence. And if you look in, in dances of that era, you see movements taken from shuffles, slaps, stomps, um, bucks and things thrown into to social dancing at that time. So a lot of what we get today is um, based upon what tap dancers were doing. And if you know ballroom versions of tap dance, you see that in like dance like varsity drag. It was popularized in 1928. That's crazy. Okay, so my final question, if we have no other questions, Benjamin, um, and my segue, unrelated to our dance discussion, but I've got a serious question for you. I've All right. crushed the rest of my uh, uh, Woodford Reserve, and if you guys want to check out the Woodford Reserve bottle in your local liquor store, I feel like I, I, should, I could do a commercial because uh, a buddy of mine, a student of mine, whose son played professional baseball and retired, he did not make the major leagues, his name is Richard Sullivan, he's a local artist here, and he was commissioned to do the uh, Woodford Reserve Kentucky Derby uh, official bottle. So if you go to your store, your liquor store, and you pull up some Woodford Reserve, I saw that decanter, I have that decanter. What, what's in it? You, it's a gift from my daughter. What's in it? Never, I'm not drinking Woodford Reserve. Fair enough. Drinking Johnny Blue. Good man, good man. I saw that decanter. I, I, think, I think I have at least a similar one, if not the same one, on my desk. And when we went widescreen, you guys can't see, but when, we, when I disappeared from the screen, we had to change the camera battery, and we went to force full screen. You could see the decanter off to his left. So it was quite nice. So here's my final question, because one of the things I like about chatting with you is, you have such a wide history of dancing that it gives you some context that we don't have as to understand where the trends might lead us. And I'm sure that the, the concepts, at least for me, continue to repeat themselves, right? Pop culture and music influences things. Dances break away. There's regional influences. At some points, those dances codify for particular reasons. So if we look back at the major changes in culture and, and wars and things, and Charles Lindbergh as being major influences. As I think about this, because this is my industry, right? We've got dance studios and dance events and online uh, lessons. And I think about how this pandemic is going to change our industry. What are some things that we can think about moving forward? Like, and I'll tell one of the things that we discussed after our videos last night was, you know, how will this change the culture of dancing? And I explained to some of the teachers, Miss Emily and Ben and, um, and Megan, you know, when I started the studio in 2015, people said, you know, what's this like? You, it must be amazing with Dancing with the Stars. And, you know, Dancing with the Stars and, and all these dance shows being on TV has been a norm for me when I've owned a studio. Pre-studio, we used to just like dream, man, if they would do a dance movie. Remember there was like the, Vanessa Williams dance, shall we dance? Was that it? Vanessa Williams? Is that the, I think Robert Royston Or dancing. Dirty Dancing. Or Dirty Dancing. Like, Huge. Man, if, Huge. One, if one of those, at that stage, it was like, if there was a, just a dance movie that came out ever in a three year period, that would be like a boon to our, our industry. And in the past 15 years, and probably quite a few of us watching, probably most of us watching this video, we've lived in an era where in essence, the economy was good and Dancing was at our forefront, and YouTube was a thing, and dance movies, and dance TV. Like, what, what, what might we expect for a cultural shift in dancing if we're not allowed to have social dances or events for a period of time? What are the, what's, a, what's a shift? And I'm making you predict, and I know you don't like to. You're a historian to look back. But, like, what can we learn from, like, the World War that, you know, World War II that, shifted dancing in its cultural influence. What can we look forward to um, as a possible outcome? Well, one thing that's going to be an interesting byproduct is, uh, say, World War II was a catalyst for hybridization because it had people from one continent on different continents. America brought the dance all over the world, and vice versa. They were cross-trained with each other. Dancers were going out to dance halls all over the world, troops everywhere in uh, dancing with natives, yeah? So if you were in Germany during the Reconstruction, that's where Pokey Woogie comes from, is Lindy hopping down in Germany. Um, so that influence of, of hybridization caused by mixing of culture. Now, 
what we have now is isolation. So isolation, um, is before moments like that, what that does is creates individual pockets. So historically, we always had regional dialects, if you will, dancing because of uh, people didn't travel as much. So with people not traveling as much, you might have innovations now happening if this extends for a period of time that might be unique. So they might be kind of stewing and making up their own stuff in the interim, you know, with their partners and they're going to come out with new stuff. So that could be interesting because you might have, you know, 50 new stuffs happening simultaneously right now that will pop out of the woodwork when this is over. So that's awesome. That's fun. Yeah, because I've, I've thought of that. It's inter- interesting you said that because I think... I love the idea of pockets. Instead, you get a lot of unique flavor. Yeah, and and that's what I liked because we've been in the online space for now a while. I think four or five years West Coast Swing Online has been in existence. Over four years. And, you know, a lot of people have said to us a couple different random things like, do you think that online lessons are a negative to, the you know, to existing dance teachers? That was one of the first questions we got. And I've, I've had that question before over the years in our first week of live videos. And I said there would be no more of a, of a negative than myself, right? I'm a dance teacher here in Louisville, Kentucky. And mm-hmm. if I was putting out my content online, why would anyone ever come to my lessons, come to my studio <laughs> if they could get the same thing online? And the reality was it doesn't affect us at all um, because... Yeah. The, the, the in-person experience of working with a teacher one-on-one in a group class, in a social setting, they're their own unique things. And so it didn't take away from, I always looked at it as a different, um, something that has its own unique advantages and disadvantages. And now that the whole world is in essence living off of an online space, um, you know, one of the things I said that it, it, the only thing it doesn't completely replace for me is uh, we, we can't go out to the, you know, I'm sure you've done this forest after class, you go out and a bunch of people go out and have a drink, have a bite to eat after the dance. And that personal interaction doesn't exist. Um, it actually does exist in a little bit cause we've had video chats. In fact, when I get off here, I'm going to get on my Facebook and see some dance friends of mine that are having a, uh, you know, a drinking night tonight. So, um, but it's, Brilliant. it's, yeah, we're all good, man. Um, it's interesting that, it might spawn some different regional influences. And for those of you guys watching, this is a good time for us to dig in and learn from all the different influences online to add to our dancing in a way. To force Absolutely. Them. Yeah, they did. for those that are savvy, even the competitive or professional dancers, if you're, if you're quick, you can really exploit this where other people are taking it as downtime and you can use this as time to innovate and to, to be a butterfly, right? To, to be in your cocoon right now, molting and changing, and then pop out onto the scene um, and have some new things to bring to the table. So that that also is gonna be something that's gonna change as well, is you have some people right now that are those hardcore people that are, that are thinking that way. They're like, oh, everyone's gonna take a breather now. It's time for me to work hard. And that's what they're gonna do, and they're gonna come out, and they're gonna come out swinging. Yeah. So that should be interesting to see happen, because I expect We'll have some surprises coming. That's fun. I think we got three more questions, if you're good with that, Forrest. Oh, like uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, too, is you're talking about influences. An example would be, uh, you talked about Kadu and Larissa. Yep. They're competing in West Coast now. Yeah. Ain't that something? Yeah, right? Ooh. And for those You think of, they're not going to bring something to the table? <clears throat> for those of you guys who don't know, like, just put in Kadu and like, K-A-D-U and Larissa Zook or Kadu Zook, Z-O-U-K into they are YouTube. bad mamma jammas. And they are bad mamma jammas in their main style of Zook, like crazy cool stuff. And they started competing in West Coast Swing a couple of years ago. They have intense work ethic. Yeah. And they are going to swing for the fences when they come back. Mark my words. Super fun. A couple questions, Benjamin, and we'll be out of here. Yes. <laughs> um, couple of questions on forest particular particularly um Forrest, what is your favorite style to dance i was gonna ask that too i'm glad someone asked that asking what your favorite feeling is you wouldn't have a context without multiple um i like tons of styles of dances um i that's why i do so many of them that's what's so intoxicating about knowledge is it gives me so many toys to play with 
So every single time I learn a new dance or get more depth in a dance, um, you fall more in love with it. And it's just more, the, the more you know something, the more you love something. Um, so I don't really believe in the idea of a favorite. I do have, if you will, one I could say is a favorite, and that is Dancing Without Limits, and that's fusion, doing whatever you feel like. That's, that's what my favorite thing to do is to do what I feel like doing and just to have clean lead follow mechanics where I can do whatever I want. It's funny you said that because, uh, and I know the question wasn't for me, but I'm going to answer it anyways. Um, you know, people say, you know, what's the best this or that? And I always say, like competitively, you know, when you're choosing the winner, and I always say, well, like, what's the, who's the best dancer? And I always like, I, I use the analogy to your point, like, what's the best feeling? What, what are you feeling? I would say, like, what's the best color? And there's no best color. Like, we have a preference. I like red. Megan likes blue. Emily likes pink. What's your favorite color, Ben? Teal. Teal. Nail. Right? Like, there you go. Four of us. We have four. I call Ben Benji blue shoes because she had a pair of blue shoes once. But we all have our own favorite um, colors. Um, but that doesn't mean any of them are the best. What do we got, Ben? Colors. Colors, question. objective and short-sighted <laughs> like, to say I, I, I don't know about colors. Right. <laughs> um, another one for Forrest. How has your knowledge of dance history affected how you dance? Ooh, that's a great question. And I would say immensely. It has changed the way I perceive dancing. Um, and through the years, that perception has changed as well. What I used to look at and think was bad or dumb down, I now see the true value in. I have a very different perspective on both teaching and my own personal dancing on what the point is. So an example would be much of dancing um, when I started was based upon competitions and who's who and what's good, like you were saying. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really care as much about that now. Uh, what I care more about is, uh, A, my own dancing as far as creating myself and my, my own image, you know, like finding what I like and learning what I like and um, do, doing what inspires me rather than following somebody else. Um, the other thing about that is that when you look at the point of dancing, when you say social dancing, right, the point of social dancing is to be able to dance with other people. The more exceptional I am, which is the nature of competition, means the more complex I am, the more complex the information, the fewer people are going to be able to do it. So complexity takes dancing away from the masses. So there's real value in simplicity. And uh, if you will, basic level dancing is actually super important for our industry. If you want dancing to survive, you need to keep basics basic and remember the difference between a fundamental figure done in a basic way, and the same figure can be done as a, at a professional level. It's the same figure, but boy, the level of training and information that you put into it is quite different, and there's nothing wrong with being basic. That's, and it, it's funny you say that, because if there is a, um, what's the word? If there is a thing that we try to convey through our videos at West Coast Swing Online, and the genesis of it was just that, and we get questions all the time in relation to this, but, you know, the genesis was going to YouTube and finding really cool patterns. And sometimes our students would bring us patterns and they would say, Hey, I want to do this. And it was like, man, the skill set you need to do that pattern is so high. So how can we, I want to do that too. I want to be Fred and Ginger, right? But you, you know, they spent a lifetime doing it. How can we deconstruct that into something that's the most approachable to the most answers? So if we do a video and I'd probably say at least nine out of 10 videos, if not nine and a half out of 10, you could take that video to your teacher and they would go, oh, I get it. Here's the basic concepts that we all agree upon that that video is working off of. And sometimes we put the crazy ones because some people want to learn them and they're a little BS and they're a little crazy. But to that point, like how can you make this all approachable to people? Because the, the stuff, we did a couple of videos on like rolling through the feet, right? And someone says, well, I don't see that, you know, the high level dancers don't do that. I'm like, well, of course they do. They do. We're teaching a very dumbed down version where you're, where you're, we're showing you this, but the articulation and the understanding of timing and how to ebb and flow that amongst the higher level dancers, it's shocking how well they know the fundamental concepts of the dance, but they're able to stretch it in such a way that when you watch that video, you can't see it. 
And at this stage as professionals, we can understand what they're doing, but it's so hard to deconstruct that because it takes so many different levels of information that as teachers, it's our goal to put it back in the box. Rambling. Yeah, super cool. It'd Something be a video that no one would watch or very few people and you'd probably blast everyone else out of the water. So <laughs> right. there's not a real that. Um, it's better to teach 100 people than it is to teach one. For sure. What you got, Ben? Going and talking about Balboa for just a second, um, they're guessing that it came from Lindy Hop, but when and how was it extracted from the other swing dances? No, not really. Not Lindy Hop. Um, most people think it came from Shag. Not Lindy Hop. Um, remember Shag uh, was done much more commonly in eight count, and it was a regional variant. So we're using the word Shag loosely because they may not have called it even Shag. They probably called it Balboa in Balboa, which is where it refers to as Balboa Peninsula. Their regional variant of Shag is most likely what it is. Um, but it was codified as in, into um, what became known as Balboa. Um, by the late 30s, for sure. 1934, I believe, is when people really started calling it Balboa, referring to Balboa Pavilion on Balboa Island. Um, so the uh, dance in and of itself, though, started to ground out and turn into a shuffle dance instead of a hop and kick face dance more so. And um, then, you, you, so if you look, um, you'll see the, the difference in styling that I see like in a film called Marijuana, the Devil's Weed from 1936, where you can see what I've talked to, to old timers about that. And they pretty much all said that's Shaq. It's Shaq done in that, that film versus Balboa. And they said the difference there being the aesthetic of it. Um, but a count Shag um, was the dominant form of Shag. And then you see it smoothed out and refined uh, into Balboa. And it also was hybridized with what they called LA swing, their own regional variant. Um, so we call that bow swing. Hope that helps. <laughs> it was also dancing what's called off time. So it used that uh, off time as well. So it had this unique concept of dancing, but um, uh, started in the mid twenties dance off time, meaning that you accented um, the upbeat instead of the downbeat. So you did a step, step, hold, step, kind of like I could do a fox rut and do step, hold, step, hold, step, step, or I could do hold, step. Old step, 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 and yeah. it's going to create a different step. Yeah, brilliant. Fun stuff. What's that? Yeah, any more questions? Or we... Um, we have questions that are continuing to roll in. So, is there a way that they can get their questions answered if they have more after this? Yeah, let's do this. If you guys have questions, we will we will track in respect to Forrest's time because he's given us two hours, and we appreciate you, buddy. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we'll grab the rest of the questions, and maybe we'll cobble them together. Maybe we'll do this again. Cool. If that's cool with you, I, I, I love talking to you. It blows my mind and that's not, that's, that's, I'm dead serious. It like on any one of these subjects, I feel like we could sit back and talk for like an hour. So, um, all you guys who ask questions so far, we will keep them together. We've been really good during the lockdown in cobbling all the questions together, um, that we don't get answered. And for those of you guys who do and don't know, um, we do one video a week where we take all the questions that come in via email, YouTube, Facebook that we're not able to get to in a specific video, and we put them together in one video. It's usually on Fridays, and that, that the video is a little bit all over the place because it's literally our way to answer everyone's questions. So um, specifically for Forrest, Great. I'm sure enough of those will come together with some of my questions. Bring it on. And we'll, we'll get together. I'm melon. Dude, you're amazing. Any questions you guys have? No? I just figured Ben and Emily. How old is Forrest? How old so are you, Forrest? there were some, some ladies that were asking how old Forrest was. Because <laughs> he looks so good. <laughs> well, I dance. That helps. But I also drink like a fish swim, so there's that. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually um, turning 42 this year. So 42. There you go. No spring chicken. Uh, yeah, that's why I've been dancing for 30 years. I started when I was about 10, 10, 11, somewhere between there. there. And... Uh, I started teaching professionally, I believe, in 1998, maybe 97 is when I started training, and I started teaching professionally in 98. That's crazy. I don't even know what kind of questions are coming in. <laughs> they're on delay, so... We just saw his reaction. They're on delay, so they saw you're like... They're on, they're on a 20-second delay, so they're laughing at things that happened 20 seconds ago. But, um, yeah, man, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, this is...
This is our third chat together, and I really do value you and your knowledge, and um, you've helped me understand dancing differently, um, understand what I don't know, and uh, created like a thirst for more knowledge in different areas. So, um, great. That's what I really want to do is is use this information, put it out there, so that people can get the value that the reason it's so intoxicating for me, and, and understand, you know, um, why why what they do is what they, they do, but also to be able to have that same freedom that the, the original innovators did and realize that you know nothing is sacred, that they innovated and they always have, and you can too. Yeah, and I, I like that to kind of close up. Like I think that's what's, what's great about you that also resonates with me is that there is an appreciation for what came before us and that that's great because that's the foundation that's set on and there's a respect to be paid to that. But what I also like about, even though you are looking back into the history of the dance, you're also using that to provide context for the fact that, hey, this stuff is changing and innovating and you should embrace the changes and innovations and cultures and musical influences um, and that neither one should be neglected um, and neither one is like held not in- mutually exclusive. Yeah, and they're not held in a higher esteem than one another. You know, the old timers that really have a deep understanding of where the dance came from, there's value in that and the newer dancers that are just ignorantly pushing us into do new areas are also um, to be paid attention to. So, brother, I appreciate My you. Opinion, mindsets are wrong, so it's just more like I love the beauty of gray, so you can, <laughs> you can have your cake and eat it too if you do both. Sounds good. All right, I'm going to sign off here. We'll talk for just a quick second off camera, but I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. If people want to hear more about you, where do they go? Dancehistorian.com? You got it. Dancehistorian.com or find me on the Facebook, uh, Forrest Outman. Yes, Bingo. and um, love to hear from you. I post up up, up there about history, is random rants and videos and such pretty, pretty often. So you'll get lots of nerdy content. Feel free to throw me a line and ask me anything you want. Why not? Awesome, brother. Thanks. I'm going to say goodbye for the live feed. We'll chat in just a second. Take care, gang. Thanks, brother. We're off. That was fun. No problem. I hope you enjoyed it. I Dude, hope it, you I know, enjoyed the value. Hell, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Yeah, and just like, yeah, oh, and broadcast.